Um, great. So um, we will just get started. No need for an, an introduction again since we introduced Adrian yesterday. So I guess we'll just get to it. Great. Uh, hi again, everybody. Um, good evening. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a you know, fairly different topic than yesterday and uh, going to walk you through some recent work that my lab have been doing in trying to understand uh, how to kind of do the whole problem in a, in a particular little creature. Um, the whole problem meaning how do we understand the complete relationship between, to, between neurons and behavior. And the animal that we've been working on is this little creature, Hydra. So this is a, a beautiful old uh, book from the 1700s um, by Abraham Tremblay. He was a, a Swiss scientist who uh, lived on this wonderful estate. And in the pond there, um, there lived these, these tiny creatures. So they're about a millimeter in size. They are a type of jellyfish, essentially. They're of the group Snydarian. And uh, one of the, the questions that he had posed to himself at that point was whether they are even an animal. You know, they kind of attach themselves to a substrate and they, they wave in the, in the, uh, in the, the water. And uh, he um, spent many years of his life um, studying these creatures because they have some really remarkable properties. And we'll talk a bit about that. Um, so here's a, a modern photograph of one of these. Uh, we, we work with the species Hydra vulgaris. Um, vulgaris just means common Hydra. There, there are about you know, 13 or so species that are distributed all over the world. Here you can see uh, in this picture how it reproduces. So this little blob at the, at the, on its um, trunk here is uh, a bud that will become another another hydra, and so they they bud off um, new copies of themselves uh, in an asexual mode of reproduction. They do they do are able to undergo sexual reproduction as well in adverse conditions. If it gets very cold or something like that, then they will go into a sexual mode. They will differentiate into male and female and um, and and transfer um, genetic material but but generally this is their their most common um, reproduction strategy what uh, so yeah just to mention my collaborators uh, this just wanted to highlight particularly uh, Rafa Yusta who's my my primary collaborator on this work and it was really Rafa that's done a huge amount of the work to to sort of uh, reintroduce I'd say or um, um, get hydro kind of reactivated as a, as a species of, uh, of interest. So why, uh, why hydro? Why would, we, why would we care about this? So what are the, the model systems in neuroscience that are, that are most prevalent? Um, people study a lot, you know, going from small to large, um, C. elegans, uh, little worm, um, Drosophila, mouse, monkey, and human, right? And they um, so, you know, where is the need perhaps for another little um, invertebrate? Hydra is really different than, you know, the most comparable species, which is, which is C. elegans. You know, C. elegans has um, maybe 300 neurons in the body. Many of them are, are what's called identified neurons, so all of them. Um, they have some names, they have some more or less distinctive properties, they have known function in the body. Hydra does not have that. So it, rather than having um, a very sort of hardwired specific nervous system, it has what's called a nerve net. Um, and so neurons that are pretty similar to one another that are just connected in kind of a, a sheet right across, across the body, essentially to sort of nearest neighbors as you're, as you're seeing here in the, in the, in the picture. Um, so there's no... Um, clear brain, right? There's no clear sort of decision nodes that that sort of control behavior in a in a clear, clear information processing pathway. Yet Hydra is able to undergo a pretty complex behavioral repertoire. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that uh, in a moment. Uh, one another aspect that's particularly exciting, I mean, I'll show you some examples, but you know, it, we we haven't really done theory on this yet, although we're you know very motivated by it, is that it is regenerative. You know, that was something that the Tremblay had discovered. 
that if you cut it into pieces, then all the pieces will regenerate themselves into, into a new animal and is one of the most regenerative animals that exist. There are others, you know, you cut off pieces that will go regrow them. Hydra you know, can, can do that to a kind of remarkable degree. Uh, you can take the animal, you can dissociate all the cells um, until they're separated, glom them back together in a centrifuge and the cells will reassemble themselves into, into a, a functional animal. And I'll show you a, a movie of that happening in a moment. Part of um, the outcome of that, and the reason for it, the reason for it is that they are continuously generating new cells. They have a kind of source of stem cells in the middle of the body. Those cells um, differentiate into, into the different uh, cellular components of the body, uh, migrate outward, and integrate themselves into the body, and while old cells kind of get pushed off and eventually sloth off the end of the body. And so the whole animal, all the cells in the body are turning over about every two weeks or thereabouts. And so if you know, it's been shown that if you, if you keep track right, of a single hydra, if nothing you know, disastrous in the environment happens to it, that same animal will persist for, for a very long time. It is the most functionally long-lived animal that, that exists. You can, you know, it's, I think um, there have been hydra that have been maintained for, for you know, tens of years which is way off the curve for, for something so small. Okay, so um, here's a couple of the behaviors. So they move around in interesting ways. So they have these tentacles uh, that they can attach to, to a surface. And when they get attached, they can pop off their peduncle is what the, the foot part is called. And they can sort of locomote like that. Here's another form of, of motion that they have. Um, not so much, they don't flip over. Sometimes they'll just kind of squidge along the ground. So they'll um, move like, a, like an inchworm um, from place to place. We are really interested in trying to understand how these complex behaviors arrive from the nerve net and what the nerve net is doing to, to control the body. And we're very much helped by that, um, by work from, um, from a few particular labs, from Selena Giuliano's lab in uh, UC Davis, um, Rafa's lab, and also uh, the lab of Rob Steele, because um, a huge amount of progress has been recently made in developing new genetic lines. So, you know, Hydra is uh, transparent, which makes it a nice model system for, for imaging. And these new genetic lines have GCAMP, have a calcium indicator expressed in, um, in the, all the neurons of the body. And so what that lets you do is um, while Hydra is kind of behaving more or less naturally, you can, you can image all of the activity uh, in, the, in the nervous system of the body. Furthermore, all of those uh, cell types have been characterized genetically uh, through a through an RNA screen that Selena Giuliano did, and so both um, <clears throat> so this um, analysis was done sort of at the single cell level and keeping track of where uh, the cells in the body came from. And what she has shown is that Hydra has um, thirteen different neuron types that are expressed in in different parts of the body, and so now we have a huge amount of information both about about the dynamics right of the of the nerve net and also the underlying um, molecular makeup of, of the cells in the body. So let me just show you how, how this self-assembly works, right? So here's um, an example of cells that have been dissociated and have been kind of brought together, you know, spun together to, to make a blob. And you can see that they, they sort of automatically form an interior and an exterior, uh, that after some time, uh, you start to see these budding off of tentacles and then um, the formation of a mouth, and you just saw it ingest, right? Just sort of spat some material out of the, you know, of the, the, the body. So that, that mouth part is, you know, basically functional. So here's, um, here's a, a redo of that type of experiment from Rafa's lab, where now um, you have the GCAP neurons uh, in the mix, right? So these have been dissociated, and now you can actually watch what the neurons are doing while while the animal is reforming. So you know initially these you know, the cells are firing fairly 
fairly uh, independently, right, as one would expect, because the whole thing is just a glom of, of individual cells. But over time, clearly, uh, those networks start to wire up, you get groups of neurons that start to fire synchronously, and start to activate um, the muscles, you know, these muscle cells of the body. Right. So if, the, if one were to watch this for long enough, um, this would do what we saw in the last case, it's organize itself into, into a, a full animal. Yeah, so these genetic lines are, are hugely advantageous for, for a study. And what is, again, special uh, with Hydra, so here's just a beautiful movie of, of the animal moving, and you can, you can watch right, the nerve nets um, fire. And I hope you, know, you can see already that a lot of the activity uh, that's happening in, in the nerve nets is sort of synchronous. There are these large groups of neurons that, that tend to fire together. If you had really good eyes, uh, you would be able to see that there are three large um, groups that fire uh, synchronously at different times, and that those three large groups seem to be, to be non-overlapping. We also have, in addition to the, the neural uh, GCAMP line, we have these GCAMP muscle lines. So we're also able to image, not, um, not in the neurons, but rather in the muscles. Uh, the activity, calcium activity in the in the muscle cells themselves, and in this particular example, um, this this line, uh, one of the the lines that's that's been developed, has um, green GCAMP, right? So GCAMP in the in the outer layer, and RCAMP, a, a red um, calcium indicator in the inner layer. So as I'll show you in a moment, Hydra consists of basically two layers, and one is able to to track. Uh, the muscle activity in both both of those layers. So this gives us a huge amount of information about the dynamics, right, of of the of the the cells that are they're making up the behavior. What makes it, I think, appealing um, for us as theorists is that it has overall a, a quite simple body plan. So there is a a layer called the mesoglia that kind of forms the, the, the structure of the body. And that supports on two sides an inner layer, the endoderm, which means inner, inner skin. And that layer um, is basically a layer, a single cell layer of cells that both act as skin and as muscle. They're excitable and they and they contract on the outer, in the outer layer, here in green, same thing. Um, it's a, another layer of skin and muscle combined uh, cells. And uh, the two, each of the layers is innervated by its own nerve net. So here in purple, these are, these are the nerves and they, they run you know, at, the, at the base of, of, this, of the respective two layers of cells. And the, the muscle cells are connected to one another. The neurons um, are also connected to one another, although this old drawing has a, as a draw, as a, uh, indicates that the nerve nets between the two layers are connected. There's actually no, no clear evidence that that's true. They seem to really be independent, the nerve nets in the, in the inner and the, and the outer layer. Um, so the whole thing sort of forms a, like a bag <laughs> and you can imagine it just like, you know, one of those potty balloons that, you know, with the, uh, that, that has, it's closed at one end. And as you squeeze it, you know, the, the body squeezes. So Hydra acts as what's called a hydrostatic skeleton. It's, it's structure and its rigidity, uh, is because of the enclosure of fluid in the inside. And then the muscle layers on the outside use that in the you know the pressure of that fluid to to cause movement and so uh, let's just go back to this picture so the muscle layers um, have fibers that run in two different directions so in the in the outer layer uh, the muscles are longitudinal so they run they run up and down the body in the inner layer they run circumferentially right so they run around the around the um, circumference of the of the interior and so to, um, to move, right, what, what does the, the animal need to do? One of the main behaviors that, that you might remember from the movie that we just watched is that it does this irregular contraction. It kind of pulls its body down into a, into a ball and then extends again. And how would one achieve that with this, with this plan? 
what you would expect is that uh, in order to contract, you would drive your longitudinal muscles. Remember the muscles can only contract. So they, it would con you would contract your longitudinal muscles to, to, um, to, you know, um, to contract yourself down. And then in order to extend again, you would expect that the endodermal muscles would then kick in and they would squeeze on the fluid and that would extend the body out again. And, and that you know, cycles of contraction and elongation, you would imagine as being kind of a um, interplay, right? Um, between offset activations of these, of these two muscle groups. So in order to dive into um, you know, the, the function of, of uh, the nerve nets, we need to be able to extract the, the calcium signals from, from these movies. And that turns out to be a relatively challenging problem, uh, even compared to, um, there's been beautiful work done um, recently by uh, people working on C. elegans, um, Andrew, Andrew Leifer and um, uh, uh, Aravi Samuel, others who are able to uh, image C. elegans while it's while it's actually moving and and um, extract the um, the activity of, of neurons during movement. We'd also love to do that with Hydra, and one can to some extent, right? But but maybe you can see the problem while while you're watching this movie, which is that when Hydra contracts and expands, its length changes by a factor of you know four or five. And so, and it's also twisting and, and moving around. And so it's a very non-rigid um, body. And you know, if, even compared to C. elegans, which does twist around, but it doesn't really um, expand, you know, um, stretch out very much. And also at the moment, um, at, well, this genetic lines are great. We don't yet have ones in which the cells are marked at all times. So what makes, what makes um, tracking doable um, and easy is if you have what's called a nuclear marker, you can express uh, a fluorescent protein in, in the nucleus of the cell so that you can see the cell at all times. You know, there is some, some light signal that lets you know where the cell is at all times. With Hydra, we only have a calcium indicator. So we only see the cells uh, when they're active, right? So that means that there are long periods of time when the animal's moving and the cells are, um, are not visible. So that's that's tricky. Um, we've, we've made some recent progress, uh, really thanks to Thibault Lagache, who was a, a postdoc in, in Rafa's lab. And so here uh, you're watching that movie uh, that I showed you again. He's developed a, a pipeline within an open source package uh, called ICI that solves, partly solves the problem at least. And so here, what he does is to use a spot detection algorithm to find uh, to find the, the neurons and, and look, um, isolate them. Then uh, you use motion correction, right? So you try and estimate how the animal is moving to try to hold the animal basically stationary. And once you've done that, you try to associate the tracks. So here's um, you know here's um, a view of that. So you have these um, frames of the movie in which you've found um, a set of bright spots. Um, you know you localize the the neurons, and now using your estimate of how the body moved, you can join these tracks together. Right? You try to associate from one frame to next <clears throat> which neuron was which. And the challenge, of course, is that you know there are these gaps, right? These long periods of time in which you don't see the neurons, and so one uses a, a probabilistic algorithm to try to, um, you know, make your best kind of Bayesian estimate of of which track belongs to which neuron. And so this works pretty well. It's definitely um, you know changed the the time scale over which we can track neurons from say. 200 neurons, uh, 200 frames to, to more like a thousand frames, but we still lose them over time. And so, um, you know, the, the, the length of data that we're getting from the movies is still, is still somewhat limited. Oh, I see questions in the chat. So I might, I think, yeah. It, so, so this would be a fine time to stop. Um, yeah. so I was yeah, sorry, I didn't, that. didn't tell you how many neurons there are in the body, right? Thank you for someone for looking that up on Google. It it really yeah, they, it changes with the size of the animals. So little animals have have a few hundred neurons as they get as they get to full size. It's maybe four thousand neurons in the in the um, um, in the, in the adult body. 
So after, se if, after separation, can each cell grow into full grown animal? Not quite, right? So there's some subtleties to, to what exactly allows the, uh, the animal to regenerate. It's not quite at the granularity of, of single cells. Uh, you, the piece that you keep needs to include something called the organizer, which, is, um, which provides the essential kind of minimal um, part of the body that's, that's required. So it's not quite at the level of, of every cell. Can, can I, Adrian, can I ask a quick question about the tracking? So um, in this tracking, are all the spots con uh, considered to be independent and you do the Bayesian estimate based on motion? Could you also use sort of relative positions? Yeah, so you know that's what's done in C. elegans, I mean, Andy Leifer's lab, and that works better in C. elegans because relative positions stay a little bit more consistent relative to one another, right? So we, we've tried, um, you know, point set registration that that algorithm is called. And it, you know, in our hands, it didn't help very much uh, because there's so much deformation um, at the, you know, as the animal is moving around. But I do, it's worth, it's worth another try uh, for sure. You know, I think, um, you know, where we're running a grant is that one can track them for a while, but then over time, you know, errors creep in. And, and so you can stop and then start again and do a whole other set of tracks. But now you've got two independently tracked uh, sets of neurons. I'm sure there are, and we just haven't done this yet, you know, good ways to kind of map those two sets of identified neurons onto one another using something like point set registration. So that's kind of the, the next challenge in the problem. Another kind of a technical uh, student uh, question is that I don't know if it's worth explicitly clarifying the relation between calcium imaging and action potentials and activity. I don't think we quite mentioned that. Anyway. Oh, okay, yes, right, great point. Sorry, I should have I should have said that. So, so cal so you learned about action potentials um, in most neurons. When neurons fire an action potential, there is also a, a flux of calcium into the cell. And so if you, um, you know, one very common way of, of recording neural activity cu currently is to use a, an indicator that fluoresces um, and it, whose fluorescence changes as a function of the calcium concentration. And so um, that's, that's what calcium imaging does. It, you know, if you, if you, um, if you excite um, the cells and you, and you track the, the amount of fluorescence that gives you um, an indication of, of the calcium uh, concentration in each cell, which corresponds to the, the firing rate, sort of, right? So, you know, the, the, the dirty secrets there are that um, it's sort of a thresholded version. It, it, there, are, there are cases where if, you, if there's a single spike, for example, you, that may not show up in the, in the calcium signal. You sometimes need a, a burst of spikes. And so it's both thresholded and also it saturates. So it sometimes, um, you know, the amount of fluorescence you get doesn't necessarily scale linearly with, it doesn't just add up. You would, you would hope, right, that every spiking event kind of gives you a known pulse of calcium, but, but that, that pulse, uh, you know, if you have many of them added on top of each other, that can be a nonlinear effect that causes that, that signal to saturate. So it's a readout of, of neural activity, not a perfect readout. Is that, that okay, Vinky? No. Yep, perfect, perfect. And also there's one more question, but also I want to be conscious that, you know, we don't want to derail it too much because we don't want to hear your signs. But um, I think there's a question about, you know, when spots overlap, do, don't you lose resolution across cells? Yeah, one hopes that they don't overlap, but uh, that is one way that errors will accumulate, right? So, so one, okay, big difficulty, right, is that there are two layers of cells, as I talked about before. And so you have an upper layer and a, a lower layer. In principle, they should be in fixed um, positions relative to one another, but it can happen that um, you're able to, to image not just the, the upper and the lower layer that are physically connected to one another, but the upper and the lower layers that are you know, on the two sides of the body. And so that makes it hard sometimes to, to get a good estimate of motion because the two sides can be moving, moving separately to one another. So yeah, all of those things contribute to the errors that make, make the tracking problem hard completely. All right, so I mentioned before, and I you know, tried not to put too many slides into today's talks, I'm hoping we'll, we'll get through it all. Um, 
Uh, so we mentioned before that there are three um, nerve, nerve, three ensembles of neurons that that fire together um, that that were identified. So they have names, you know, RP, which means rhythmic potential, rhythmic potential one, rhythmic potential two, and the contraction burst, which is associated with with that big contractile event. And um, you know, here's some just some basically rasters of of activity. So RP one clocks away, RP1 is in the ectodermal, the outer layer of the nerve net. Uh, the contraction burst is also in the outer layer of the, uh, of the nerve net, as you would hope, right? Because that CB contraction burst controls the contraction uh, that should drive, right? The longitudinal muscles, because those are the ones that can, can um, squish the animal down. You might be able to see sort of in this image that there seems to be a slight anti-correlation between the firing of RP1 and of CB. Uh, RP2, that's in the endoderm. And that, you know, in this particular example um, is not super regular, but very often you'll just see that, that activity pattern just clocking along at a, at a very regular frequency. It's almost like, like a heartbeat um, that just sort of um, continues very, very rhythmically. All right, so how do um, the neurons drive the, the hydrostatic skeleton? So as I mentioned, you know, in the ectoderm, which drives the longitudinal muscle, you have the contraction burst and RP1. Uh, in the endoderm, you have the, the RP2 network. In our hands, as far as we can see, uh, the, the only direct behavioral, um, the only neural event that has a direct behavioral consequence is this contraction burst. And that very clearly drives the, um, drives the, 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 um, the outer muscles. So what, what um, I want you to notice here, and you might have you might have seen this if you um, had sharp eyes while watching the movie earlier, is that um, looking at the muscle activity, there really are a couple of distinct types of, of muscle events. There's this you know large scale one where uh, during contraction where everybody lights up very rapidly, all the cells. But if, um, if you look clearly, um, if you look carefully, you can sometimes see that there are these sort of slower events that move through uh, the body column here, for example. So the, the muscle layers seem to be able to support um, two distinct sort of time scales and length scales of, of activation. So just to zoom a little bit uh, closer in on those slow waves. So here's um, any, I feel like I missed some slides. Um, so here's an example of the um, of of the animal uh, moving slowly. What we've been able to do with our analysis is to analyze this image to extract the optic flow, to extract movement in the picture, and thus to hold the animal um, fixed. Right. So um, what what. What that means is that we we kind of draw a uh, basically a grid on the on the animal's body, right? Ideally, what one would like to do this analysis is to be able to take that um, coordinate system that we've say inscribed on the body and follow it over time using using the the movement of the body. And so when we do that, uh, if we've been able to estimate right, the movement across this kind of grid on the, on the surface of the animal, we can then run that in reverse and we can hold the animal, have the animal fixed in the movie, right? So here's the original movie. Here's the movie where we've extracted the optic flow and we, and we, we run it in reverse on the, on the frames. And now you see, we, we hold the, the, the image still. And now you can see these, these waves um, propagating. It, when I have your, when I have this, this here, um, the faces here, does that, um, does that get, can you see that or do you only see the screen? You don't see my, my, my gallery of faces. I'm just wondering if I should, if I can keep it up there and or whether it bothers you. All right. So um, here's the stationarized animal. You see the, these slow waves moving through um, the, the body surface. <clears throat> 
Okay. So in order to analyze movement, you know, that would be kind of the best possible way that we could, um, we could extract movement from, from the animal. We would have this complete, you know, fine grid of, of points through, through the body that we would be able to track. And then we would be able to know exactly where all the pieces of the body are, are contracting and, and moving. Uh, we're, you know, because of the reasons I mentioned before, I mean, the optic flow estimates are, are fairly noisy, so we can't do it over, over very long periods of time. And so we have focused for the moment on a, on a simpler analysis, which is that um, we extract just a couple, we track just a couple of points in the body. And to do that, we use um, a, a code called deep lab cut, which is very, you know, has become a kind of sensation in neuroscience in the past few years. Uh, a beautiful um, development by um, Mackenzie and Alexander Mathis. And what, what they have done is um, develop uh, a toolbox where you can take your movie of, of an animal behaving and you can, you can tag a, a few points on the body. So if you were doing mouse, you might say track, you know, tag the, you know, the, the ears and the paws and the tail, something like that. And if you, you do, if you label some, smallish number of frames, say 100 frames, then um, this is a, a deep deep neural network that then will interpolate between those frames and track those label points over time. And so super helpful um, for, for um, behavioral analysis in general. So we use that on Hydra. Hydra is not the ideal uh, application of deep lab gut because there aren't that many well identifiable locations on the body that because of its symmetric nature right? and it's so smooth so it doesn't have a lot of features. So the features that that we um, that we focus on are we try to identify a point in the on the peduncle and what we would call the armpits right so where the tentacles kind of attach the lowest tentacle attaches to to the body the body column. And so when we track those three points over time, we can then take these two, uh, we draw a line between them and bisect it. And then what we, uh, we, we extract this kind of center line by you know, taking the point at the peduncle, this point in the middle, we draw a line between them and we basically skeletonize the, the image of the animal so that we, we keep track of, the, of that center. And so one can then watch that over time as the, you know, just that one um, parameterization of, of the animal's length and also of its curvature over time. So what, um, what do we see, right? When we, we, we look at the length of the animal over time, that's here in, in blue. And now, you know, you're watching here the contraction. So the length gets smaller and then there are several um, sort of bursts of the, of the nerve net and that kind of contracts the animal down into its sort of smallest possible um, size and then it elongates again. And now here you're looking at just the integrated fluorescence in the muscle layers in the, ecto in the ectoderm and the endoderm together. And I hope you'll notice that there's something uh, sort of anomalous here, at least from the point of view of how one might think that the, um, that the two muscle layers are working to, to generate that behavior, which is that their activity is basically synchronous. And you probably did actually see that in the movie, but maybe didn't, didn't think about what, what that, that means. So as I said before, one might have thought right, that in order to contract and elegate, then you would want to, to contract your ectodermal muscles in order to get small and then uh, contract the, the endodermal muscles in order to elongate again. So you would expect to see these muscles acting kind of out of sync, but in fact, they're, they're firing completely together. They, you know, they fire at the same time. The, the activity in the endoderm decays away when you would expect it to be most active, which is during this elongation period of the, of the cycle. And so that poses you know, um, a mystery. So why, why does it work like that? How does it work like that? You know, wh how does Hydra manage to contract when, uh, when those layers are basically working against each other? And why is the ectoderm active even though there are no neurons right, in the endoderm that are, um, that are driving that activity? Right, so what we wanted to do is build a model that would help us uh, account for, for these findings. So can we build a bottom-up bottom model 
to simulate behaviors caused by neural activity. And there were just these particular puzzles that immediately um, jump up. You know, what, what allows for two time scales of muscle dynamics, right? We have um, the same set of cells that are participating both in the slow waves and in the fast waves. How does uh, how do they they you know inter how do they coexist in the same um, in the same cell layer? Why are both the muscle layers activated during the contraction burst? How can that be? And how is it that Hydra can contract when when both those layers are activated? So in order to do that, what we're going to do is try to build really a complete model of the animal. At the moment, we're not. <clears throat> directly modeling the nerve net. We just record the neural activity and use it to drive. Where we're really focusing is on this epithelial layer. So rather than rather than being maybe a neuroscience project, this is almost more a muscle uh, project because I would argue that in Hydra, uh, the muscles themselves are actually doing part of the computation, right? They, they are active, excitable cells and they are... Um, carrying out right, some of the dynamics that, that lead to behavior that's only partly uh, triggered by, by the nerve net. So in order to understand how the muscles then drive subsequent behavior, we are also going to build a biomechanical model such that we use the, the forces that we derive from muscle act activity to, to really make um, basically a puppet hydra and to be able to drive it with, with, um, through this entire chain of, of signaling. And this, you know, just to give thanks um, to Heng Ji Wang, who's um, um, he was he's my graduate student in physics, who's done uh, done all of this work. Uh, questions? Okay, yeah, they're all right. I'm going to let others. I think there are actually better people to answer these questions in the in, <laughs> on the chat. So thank you, Vicky, and others for for taking care of specific questions. So what we're going to um, to do is to build an explicit model for, um, for the muscle cells. And so hydro muscles are something like smooth muscle. And uh, in order to model them, what we realize in watching, watching their activity patterns is that we may need to incorporate mechanisms that, that um, activate, activate the muscles, that is generate calcium in the muscles because it's calcium that then um, interfaces with, with the actin myosin um, stretch mechanisms of, of the muscle fibers. And, and so we postulate that there are two pathways of activation um, within these cells. One is the fast pathway, which is similar to what you get in heart tissue, that there are voltage gated channels in the membrane uh, of the cells that allow calcium to flow in from extracellular sources, and that that is triggered by uh, by perhaps a neuropeptide that that acts directly on these on these voltage gated channels. At the same time, uh, there's an additional pathway for release of of calcium within muscles, and that is a G protein coupled receptor pathway. So here we we assume that it's actually a different neuropeptide. It acts on this G protein coupled receptor. What that does is to, you know, there's a, there's a cascade of, of effects that um, release IP3. IP3 then, then um, acts on, uh, on IP3 receptor on the surface of the endopl endoplasmic reticulum that then releases calcium from internal stores. You know, this internal store either the endoplasmic reticulum or the sarcoplasmic reticulum, not, not completely sure, but um, it, uh, there is a, a, a pool of calcium within the cell that then can be released through this, this slow chemical pathway. So then um, what, what that means is, you know, what we postulate at least, is that there are two distinct ways that the nerve net or that the, the rest of the body can, can trigger activity in muscle cells and that they then act either through this kind of chemical messenger pathway or through this electrical pathway. And that those signals then propagate through the muscle layer with the two distinct timescales that come with these two different signaling, um, signaling methods, right? So if you have an electrical signal within a cell, if those cells are coupled gap junctionally, that electrical signal will then be shared with its neighbors very rapidly, right? Because it's it's, it's traveling, you know, at the speed of a of an electrical propagation. 
whereas the slow signals we assume to be carried through um, diffusion of IP3 um, from cell to cell. And because that's diffusive, that would travel at, at a slower speed. So we then, uh, yeah, right, just to, you know, for those who are interested, I'm not going to really go into details here, but just to show you the, uh, the details of the equations that we use. So the key variable is the calcium concentration in the cell. And that um, comes both from, from different current sources. One where it's being, you know, these, these guys are all about real, you know, input and output of calcium into these intracellular stores. And then uh, there's also a term. So the, the, blue, the blue terms are all the uh, intracellular um, pathway, right? So the endoplasmic reticulum has a concentration of calcium that varies over time. And we also have to keep track of the IP3 concentration which then um, triggers the release of, release of calcium from those intracellular stores. So that's the, the terms that, that um, are that blue slow pathway. And then there is a current that comes from these calcium channels, or, um, channels that, that allow the flow of calcium. I think they are um, L-type um, potassium channels that allow calcium in. Yeah. And um, that then changes the, the membrane potential and allows the influx of calcium. All right, so how does that all look when we hook, the, we hook this um, set of cells up together? We, uh, we, we make a fairly realistic model. We go into the, an image and we count the, the cells in, in the two layers. It's about 60 by 30. Um, cells and for you know the hydras that we've been that we've been imaging which tend to be on the on the small side <coughs> we assume that <coughs> there are two layers you know this inner and outer layer and now we drive calcium dynamics in the in the muscle sheet and so to do that um, we sparsely stimulate um, the, some some neurons in the um, in the in the the outer layer how exactly that happens, we haven't seen um, direct evidence for neurons that trigger those slow waves, but because they cause a, quite a slow behavioral response, it's not necessarily likely that we would have seen that in the, in the neural imaging, because what we would want to see is that a neuron fires and then there's, there's some kind of slow behavioral response that, that is a result of that, of that slow calcium wave. We don't have, if you remember, the, um, imaging of the neurons and the muscle layers together. So we can't very directly infer this connection, but in order to just, you know, we, we take it as given that we can trigger uh, the muscle layer and we can trigger the, the slow waves in the muscle layer through some kind of input, which we assume is a very sparse uh, neuronal, neuronal firing. And so we're able to, to capture uh, the kinds of dynamics that we, that we see in the movies. In order to generate bending, um, what, what corresponds to bending is a wave that travels up from the peduncle, right? So if you, if you drive the, the endoderm, that's going to cause contraction, slow contraction in the, in, the, in the outer layer that will, so, you know, if you have a wave that's propagating up through one side of the body, that will cause a contraction. It will cause the whole, um, the whole column to, to bend um, in, that, in that direction. And so we can, we can trigger those by, by driving Again, a small group of cells at some some point in the peduncle, and that wave travels out as we as we see in the in the movies as well. And the fast wave we take to be to be triggered by by a few neurons here in the peduncle, and that um, that wave travels very rapidly. You know, here it's 100, 100 milliseconds throughout the body, whereas these waves are are spreading through the body in time scales more like seconds. Okay, so we have shown right that these models are able to to you know capture the the dynamics of of calcium activation in the in the muscle layers and are able to give access to these two different time and length scales of of muscle activation. We have still this mystery of why we get a simultaneous activation of both layers when when the drive of the of the muscles is only occurring through the neural, um, the nerve net that's in the in the ectoderm. And so, what 
we assume is, uh, you know, that very simply, in fact, that, you know, I mentioned before that, um, that the two layers are separated by, by this acellular layer, the mesoglia, but there is evidence for penetration of the mesoglia by gap junctions that has not been seen to couple neurons, but that doesn't mean that it can't couple muscles. And so why don't we make a, a simple assumption that these two layers have channels between them that allow them to communicate with one another. And so we want to make sure that that can work. You know, what does our coupling need to do? Uh, we only see the propagation of the electrical signal between the two, between the sharing of the electrical signal between the two, the two muscle layers, right? That fast contraction burst is shared between the two layers. Whereas these slow waves of muscle activity are never seen in the endoderm, right? So whatever drives them, we don't want that to propagate to the endoderm because that's not what's seen uh, in the movies, in the, in the videos. And so if we connect them too um, heavily, then both the, the fast wave, right? The electrical wave gets shared between the two layers and also the slow wave is able to, to make it between the two layers too. So it can't be too dense. It can't be too um, sparse either because then that won't allow the electrical signal to, to be uh, shared between the two layers either. But if we use a you know, intermediate um, level of connectivity, then indeed the, the two layers are able to share the electrical activity, but filter the, the chemical signal. So that remains only in the ectoderm, while the, the large you know, burst of electrical um, signal that causes the contraction is shared between, between the two layers. So that's one simple idea about, about why um, the two layers may, may share that pattern. And then uh, we need to understand how that can work right, to drive contraction. As we understand the hydrostatic skeleton, the two layers acting together should not uh, work to, to, to contract because if they're both firing at the same time, then they're basically acting against each other, which would sort of not, not allow that contraction to happen. So what we'd like to do is to take um, the output of our, of our muscle model and use it to drive a biomechanical model of the body and see if we can understand how, how that all works. So the first step in doing that so far, our model for the muscle layer is entirely um, about calcium concentration. We need to take calcium concentration and convert that into muscle stress. And so um, I won't go through this in detail, but just um, quick, quick zoom in on, on how muscles work right there. Um, I really don't know a huge amount of muscles, so don't, I, won't, I won't spend a lot of time on this, but um, they, they work through the interaction between uh, these fibers of myosin and actin. And um, they, they form kind of links between them. And so what calcium does, is it, it, it removes, so this troponin molecule um, sort of is, is um, released from the actin filament, which provides locations at which actin and myosin can then form, form links between them. And so it, the, the two molecules kind of slide over one another, forming and unforming uh, these links that then cause, cause the muscle to contract. And so calcium plays the role of sort of allowing um, changing the rate of, of these, of these crosslinks. And so the model that we're going to use to, to convert calcium into stress is uh, a well-known model um, for, for muscle, which is called the High Murphy model. And it's a kinetic model for uh, the formation of those crosslinks between actin and myosin. So A and M are actin and myosin. And there are um, kinetic parameters that, that take one through the sequence of how the actin and the myosin um, interact with one another, and they form bridges right, be between them that, that, that um, one can read off in terms of the total amount of force that the, that the muscle is generating. So given uh, that model that converts calcium into, into force, we then use that to drive um, a biomechanical um, explicit model of the, of the hydrostatic skeleton. So we build um, a model using a finite element method. So in physics, um, that means that you take, um, you make a model for the geometry of the body. 
So here, what we're going to do, um, although, you know, in real life, I told you that, that the body has, um, you know, this mesoglia and then the internal and the external layers, we're going to just glom them all together and try to understand their biomechanical properties as an entire, you know, sheet, because they are all mechanically coupled to one another. So we don't think we have to model it at that, at that level, level of detail. So we take the body, we divide it into, into, you know, little elements and each of these elements we assume has um, viscoelastic properties. So it's some, somewhat spring-like, but it also has, um, has viscosity. And so uh, these are every, every one of these um, elements in the body is modeled as what's called a Kelvin white element. So it has uh, a springiness, a spring constant. So the force uh, that's, that's associated with that springiness is proportional to the displacement or the size of that element or the, you know, the um, degree of, of change in, in length of that element. And there's also a, a viscous um, component uh, modeled here as a, as a dash part who's, where the force across the dash part is proportional to the, um, to the time derivative of the displacement. So that's the standard um, Kelvin white element that just models straightforward uh, viscoelasticity, very often um, people have found that biological tissues are better modeled, not through this straightforward um, linear, linear uh, system, but by assuming that, they're, that the stress-strain relationship, right, or the force-displacement force relationship, so force and displacement, one um, in biomechanics, one typically converts into uh, variables that are that are normalized. So the strain is the normalized displacement and the stress is the normalized force per unit area, but same, same idea that, that we talked about before. And so um, in order to model biological materials, very often one takes that relationship. So if it were a pure viscoelastic element, the relationship between stress and strain would be, would be linear. You know, the, the two terms I showed you before were linear. Um, what works better for many biological tissues is to assume that they are, they are not linear. That's a nonlinear relationship between the two of those. And that's called hyperelasticity. So we, we um, you know, we, we, when I say, you know, we, I mean, Hengji in, in combination with this wonderful software package, Console Multiphysics, which is great. It lets you sort of define the geometry and define all the equations. And then Console takes care um, of all, you know, getting all the boundary conditions right and, um, you know, setting up this, this system of equations uh, for us. We also um, assume that the body is filled with fluid, and so it also takes care of that uh, of the pressure distribution of pressure um, that in on the interior fluid throughout the the cavity. So very nice to have have that uh, system in place, so we don't have to um, make that up from scratch. And so now, uh, of course, we have our epithelial cell model, which which generates calcium dynamics. We pass it through the High Murphy model to convert calcium dynamics in the two layers into forces. And now we apply those forces as active forces. So each one of these blocks is one of those viscoelastic elements. We now assume that that gets, that gets um, longitudinal, longitudinal forces from the calcium activation of the ectoderm and that it's subject to circumferential forces through the activation of the endoderm, right? So we just read off the activity in those two layers and apply them as longitudinal and circumferential forces on our, on our um, viscoelastic elements. Okay, so uh, now let's drive that model with, uh, with the measured calcium dynamics or the simulated calcium dynamics. Adrian, Adrian, before you do that, yeah. I wonder if you could pause to answer a couple of questions, yes. which I don't think yes, we could absolutely. answer. So I think we've been answering some, some technical things, but Great. there were some Great. questions about uh, like the connection between the ecto and the endoderm. Is that sort of random? What is that? Right. Is that yeah, we do one? just assume that they are randomly connected. That's right. Okay. That's right. And then most recently, I don't know if you can read uh, the question about circumferential muscle contraction. Would that result in torsional strain? And should that be included and whatnot? Um, torsional. So that um, I'm not. I'm not sure why. Um, yeah, I'm not, I know. Mean, I don't know if it needs more. That might be a but... level of of sophistication in thinking about about the biomechanics that you know we we just assume that that 
you know, those circumfer circumferential muscle contractions, right? They're acting, um, you know, if we if we zoom into a, a single a single cell um, or a single element, right? That the muscles uh, of the endoderm are 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 contracting that way. <laughs> so we we just apply at at every element a you know a, a, a horizontal basically contraction to to those um, to those elements. So I'm not I'm not quite sure um, what would be different about about a torsional force. So maybe maybe we can we can you can yeah. help me out a bit more with that question offline. If that's All right. If Great. That's okay. Thanks. All right. Um, yeah. So if we take our output of our of our calcium signals and we drive the the body with that, as you would expect, um, indeed the two muscle layers kind of act against each other. And we don't get the contraction that we that we see in the in the real animal. So what might be going on? So um, one possibility is that the two muscle layers have different properties, right? So although they're being driven essentially with the same calcium signal, that calcium may have different effects in the two muscle layers. And famously, there are um, muscles in say the mollusk that are able to hold their, their tension for very long times. And one can capture this within the High Murphy model by assuming that, that the different muscle layers have different parameter settings such that once calcium gets the endodermal muscles into, into this sort of locked state, that it, it stays there for a long time, right? So that the, that the kinetics sort of hold that long locked state um, for extended times, even though the calcium signal has already, has already gone away. Once, you know, once that molecular conformation has changed, that, that it, it stays there. And so uh, if we assume that the ectoderm is phasic, right, that it has fairly rapid responses. So let's hear, um, you know, the black or the, uh, the neural firing events that drive the, drive the, um, the, uh, the muscle layers. And here's the green is the, is the, is the, oh, sorry. No, I think, sorry, the, the black is the calcium and the green is the output of the Murphy model in terms of the, the force that's generated uh, by that muscle layer. And so the, the ectodermal, the ectodermal layer uh, has a force profile that kind of, you know, tracks along with the calcium with a little bit of, of um, um, you know, extended, extended time costs. But let's assume that the endoderm has a, a much slower response so that it takes a while to build up. And then once it has built up, that force uh, remains, remains kind of constant while, even though the calcium has, has decayed away. And so that, that idea that the two muscle layers have, have different dynamics indeed is enough to explain, you know, both that uh, how the body can contract when the two muscles layers, when the two, there is calcium in the two muscle layers and how the body can extend. So um, at the moment, you know, prior to um, this, this idea, we really didn't know, you know, how it was that it, unless it's just simple, elastic um, restoration of, of the body length back to the resting length. And uh, there was no explanation of how um, the, the, that extra elongation even happened because you know, the calcium in the, in, the, in the ectodermal muscles has gone away. And so if we assume that those muscles are still actually active and generating force, even though the calcium has gone away, then that accounts for how we can get this elongation um, beyond rest length. Okay, so let's um, see how, let's put that all together, right? So just to, just to say, this um, seems actually like quite a, a good idea, right? So that one bursting event in the ectoderm drives both contraction and elongation by making use potentially of differential dynamics in the two muscle layers. So you only need the one neural event to drive the two, the two sets of muscles. And even though they're firing together, they end up having um, an impact that is that is offset in time and carries out that that cycle. So it's kind of an efficient way to use your neural signals in order to you know take take advantage of, of the muscle dynamics. All right. So then what we can do is just you know um, run the, run this through the the whole animal. Uh, we ex identify firing events. Uh, from from one of the movies, right? So this is one of the neural movies. We extract 
uh, the, the times at which the, the CB network fires. And so, yeah, here, here the blue guys are the CB events. You can see these other events, that's the RP, right? This is, this is um, GCAP from the ectoderm. So just to point out to you, right, that that, um, that RP is kind of clocking along in the background um, at, the, at the same time, and we don't really know what influence that has on muscles. Um, we also assume that from time to time, there is some neural event that triggers uh, slow waves to, to drive the bending in the peduncle. So we, we, we don't have direct measurement of that um, because they seem to get initiated during the contraction when all the, all the CB network is activated. And so even if there were individual cells that were firing to, to initiate those, those bends, they would be very hard to see in among the, uh, the firing of the CB. So we assume, we assume that, they're, that they're there. And we now use that to drive here um, the slow waves um, and also um, the fast waves. So this is the, the ectodermal calcium activation. This is the endoderm. And now you can see the hydra is going through these nice um, cycles of behavior and looks quite a lot like, like a, a real animal. Okay, so just to, you know, a little bit more quantitatively match that, um, we now you take our, our simulated hydra, we extract the length and overlay that with the data from this actual animal that was um, recorded, um, whose neural activity was recorded. You see that we really get a nice, a nice fit. Um, you know, we, we've got the, basically the viscoelastic properties more or less right, right? So that the, you see a little bit of um, these bouncing, bouncing back of the body. Um, we, we seem to have, have captured that. And we also capture how it, how it elongates. Uh, just to show you on a second animal, this is a different video from another animal. We, you know, we again extract uh, the neural firing events, run it through the, uh, you know, the, um, the force generation and the biomechanics. And here again, we're getting, we're getting quite a nice match. In this case, the animal doesn't extend um, quite as far as the uh, as our simulation. And if one looks back at this movie, you can see that what had happened there is that the tentacles had gotten stuck to the to the substrate, and so it wasn't actually able to to extend um, all the way. It was it was kind of stuck. So we have a good you know we have a reason for why that why that doesn't fit fit perfectly. Um, any more questions? Does that mean that every contraction event is followed immediately by an elongation event? Yes, there are there are times at which you see just a single contraction, um, not in this particular sequence or or the one before. Um, oh, oops. Um, there are times where the CB network just seems to fire, and you get one contraction. Um, and that just decays away, so you don't necessarily get the full um, the full um, elongation change after that. And that might make sense too, because if you remember from these dynamics uh, that we're simulating for the, um, for the endodermal layer, it takes some time for, for the, the um, force in the endoderm to build up. And so one might not expect to see any influence in the, in the elongation um, for just one single contraction um, burst fire. Okay, <clears throat> right. So that's what we've done in terms of um, using um, biomechanics and, and muscle activity to simulate behavior. You know, we would like to build up to more complex behaviors. The next step won't be trivial, right? Bending and, and contracting are relatively straightforward because the animal is still attached to the substrate. If we now have to think about how force causes the peduncle to kind of pop off the substrate and then the animal to, to move, uh, we now have to really deal with the, the adhesion right, of, the, of the peduncle to the substrate and also potentially the animal's interaction with the, the fluid, with the ex external fluid at the moment. We don't, we're not too worried about that, right? We assume that it's not, um, not that it's moving in water is more or less the same as moving in air. But I think once we start to, to deal with somersaulting and more complex behaviors, we're going to have to take into account uh, the fluid on the outside as well. So that's, 
bit more bit more complicated. All right, so I just want to say a few things um, about um, you know just some very preliminary thoughts on on modeling the neural activity as well because that's sort of the next the next stage and clearly the, the simplest um, starting point is the is this contraction burst in the actinum like to understand where that comes from and what governs it and what um, what is important to to um, try to figure out is well a why is the contraction burst there at all and the um, the key issue we think and many people have thought over over you know decades of study of hydra is that one of the most important things for a freshwater membranous membranous animal to do is to get rid of water right so there's salt in the cells and and it's living in fresh water and so there's a huge amount of osmotic pressure that is kind of such that the animal is constantly absorbing water from from its environment and so here what you're seeing is um is a, a hydra sphere so we you know this, this group took hydra chopped it into pieces just cut out um, a little piece that then formed itself reformed itself back into a sphere and now that sphere um, doesn't have you know a head or a tail and so what happens is that um, while it's sitting around in fresh water, it swells up. And then from time to time, it basically bursts and releases the fluid inside. So swells and bursts, swells and bursts, swells and bursts. Once it's done that a few times, it, you know, it does forms an axis, right? It forms a, um, a pole such, such that it has, you know, a location for the, for the hippostome, for the mouth um, emerges, and then that establishes where the foot should be. And once it has a mouth, then there is a natural place for it to open, right? And so now these cycles of, of bursting happen regularly at a, a sort of a lower threshold and in a much less um, intermittent way. So it now just nicely regulates um, its, its own size and, and presumably um, fluid content. And so um, one can see uh, similar dynamics in, in the complete hydra. And so this is a long movie uh, from just a wild type hydra that, that Chris Dupre took um, when he was at Woods Hole. And so this is just evaluating, it's just sort of basically, um, modeling the the body as sort of a cylinder and just looking at the at the volume of that of oh, sort of a cylinder a, a, a kind of ellipse modeling the the size of that ellipse and you can see this very similar kind of swelling over over periods of time and the the fast changes here are contraction bursts on top of that on top of that swelling event um and yeah so hydra seems to be doing something very similar kind of swelling and eventually bursting in a way that that releases uh, the contents of of the entron of the of the interior cavity so if you look in detail at the structure of of hydra's um, skin of the of this muscle layers you see that there are these kind of vacuoles in in the skin that seem to be repositories for water and um, you know they turn out to be you know all the way through <laughs> through the two the two layers, and so presumably what's going on during you know over over time is that these are um, water is coming in and it's you know the um, the tissue is sort of storing the water in these in these vacuoles, and that perhaps the goal of the joint muscle activation of the inner and the outer layer firing together is to kind of you know squeeze out those vacuoles such that the water is ejected either to the outside or into the enteron and you know so if it keeps squeezing on every contraction burst that forces the water into the interior and eventually right it gets tense enough that that it will burst and open the mouth and release all the fluid in the in the interior and so you know that's um this old drawing is very consistent with more recent data from Jeff Lickman's lab. Jeff is um, uh, has a lab at Harvard that are specialists in uh, connectomics. So they do, um, with Hydra at least, they have, have frozen it and then they make very thin slices and use electron microscopy to look at the, 
at the you know the very fine structure of the animal and here in blue that's all uh, the locations of these of these water vacuoles and so the tissue seems to be full of these um you know big big um, kind of storage storage um, vacuoles to to hold the water yeah, but you know that so that suggests a reason why the contraction burst is needed and potentially also why the two muscle layers um, acting together um, is is needed. What sets the contraction frequency and that's still very much a, an open problem. One thing that seems to influence it is the degree of gap junctional coupling between between neurons or at least the fact that neurons seem to be gap junctionally coupled. So gap junctions are, are a, um, a form of, of junctions between cells and Hydra uh, is, seems to be full of them. Gap junctions in mammals are, are um, built of, of proteins called connexins. Uh, in Hydra and in many, many, uh, and in vertebrates, those equivalent proteins are inexins. So Hydra is full of inexins. Every cell type seems to express um, some type of inexin. And so um, here's a picture of Hydra where one of those inexin types, inexin two, is labeled in blue. And what you can see is that there's a real concentration of inexin at the peduncle. And you might have re you might remember from the from the neural movies that when you see a contraction burst, there's a you know a huge concentration you know, of of the contraction burst neurons in the peduncle, which is presumably what we're seeing reflected here in the in those gap junctions. And so this group um, uh, in Japan, they, they uh, manipulated the gap junctional coupling. So, so what you're seeing here are sequences of contraction bursts. So the orange is the onset of the contraction burst event. And then the gray, you know, each event um, has, has a sequence of firing that occurs for some time. And so the gray just says how long that, that burst event went on. So that's normal behavior. Uh, if you use a, an antibody to an exon 2, which, which um, affects their, their coupling, then now you see that the, for one, the, um, the burst goes away, right? So you only see the onset of the event and almost never see multiple, you know, you don't see that that, that event um, continues as a, as a burst. And it also uh, has a much lower frequency of, of, of bursting. Uh, you can also use heptanol, which is a blocker of gap junctions. It's a you know what, what people call a dirty drug. It does a lot of a, a lot of things, but um, and so it's not a very clean manipulation. But that also has a very dramatic effect on the uh, on the um, frequency and the bustiness right of the of the contraction bust. And so that's a big clue that inexin is probably. Um, a, a key, you know, that gap junctions are a key player in establishing the properties of the network that both um, um, set the, the fundamental frequency of the CB and that also um, let, it, let it generate multiple, multiple bursts in, a, in, a, in an event. Another very important parameter, external parameter that, that sets the contraction frequency is osmolarity. So as I, as I already said, you know, what hydras, one of Hydra's main goals in life is to not burst, you know, is to, is to deal with the water that it's constantly absorbing. If you change the osmolarity, if you change the saltiness of the external medium, obviously you can't change it too much or it'll die, but uh, if you make it a little bit more salty so that the osmotic pressure is, is reduced, then you see that the, that the uh, frequency of contractions also goes down, very much supporting the idea that, that it is some kind of um, signal um, of, of you know, water absorption that might, that might have drive the network to fire. And so I guess our, our leading hypothesis is that there's some kind of feedback between neural firing and the mechanical signals from, from the stretch of the water absorption that's in a, a kind of feedback um, cycle. So we assume that um, the CB networks are gap junctionally coupled. Here in, in some of our preliminary models, we've also assumed that the RP1 network in, is an, acts as an inhibitory network. If, if there, that is, seems to be a fairly weak effect, but, but does seem to be an anti-correlation between the firing of those two, of two, those two networks. And then we assume that the CB network is getting essentially sensory input from 
the degree of, of water absorption. So uh, there, there are piezo channels, which are mechanosensitive sensitive channels. At least there's the um, genetic you know, possibility, right? There's piezo is expressed in, in uh, many of the cells of the body. And so there are many ways that, that a stretch signal could be, um, could be um, communicated to, to the neural network. And so we, we're working on some models whereby um, as, as, the inter as the tissue is stretching, right, as these vacuoles are, are getting, um, getting filled up with water, that sends a signal to the CB network, which at some point crosses threshold, and the CB network will fire. Um, that that um, every, every contraction um, removes water that slightly reduces the, the signal on the, of the stretch of the vacuoles, and that that kind of works in a, in a feedback cycle until, um, until that, that burst um, finishes, right? Yeah, so uh, you know there, as I, as I mentioned, there are inexins um, everywhere in the body. They're, you know, they do seem to potentially, they may potentially define cell types and cell groups. So one another idea that that we're um, that we're following up is the possibility that uh, the inexins themselves may be kind of the the defining characteristic of a of, of these sub networks right the the three sub networks may be the way that they um, become part of an ensemble is that they have the same kind of inexin and so we've been doing some experiments to test whether whether inexins um, do form um, heterotypic or homo homomeric homomeric or heteromeric um, connections so if you express inexin say two in one cell and you express it in another cell and you put them close to each other, then they will form functional connections. Here, here's an example of an X and 10, in fact. Um, and then um, in the lab, we've also been looking at the properties of cells that are connected with, with such gap junctions. And so we've been trying to understand if there's, um, if, if um, different inexins sort of only form connections with their own type of inexin, which would provide a mechanism for those subnetworks to wire up and, and to form sort of unique and non-connecting um, groups, right? So if inexins only form same type junctions, then that provides a very straightforward way, both during re-aggregation and during the continuous, um, you know, sort of plasticity that Hydra has, for a neuron that's born, you know, with a particular inexin type to find its partners and to wire itself sort of automatically into that, into that network. And so I, you know, I find this a very straightforward and sort of compelling idea that, that there may be just sort of almost mechanical ways that, that these neurons sort of find their, find their, their network and, and can continuously, um, incorporate themselves into the network without there having to be activity dependent plasticity rules or something like that, but rather just sort of mechanical, you know, almost like Lego blocks that can find each other and, and connect in. All right, so, you know, ultimately uh, we hope we will get a lot more detailed information about, about how all the cells are wired together. At the moment, we're assuming primarily gap junctional coupling, both because um, we know the gap junctions are, are there, but also because of these synchronous activity patterns across large groups of neurons, that seems to, to make sense that that would be mediated by direct, direct um, gap junctional or other, other types of, of junctional connections between, between the cells uh, in the body. Um, but it would be great to have direct evidence of that from connectomics. And so we are, um, you know, talking, you know, Rafa, uh, Justa's lab is collaborating closely with Jeff Lickman and we're kind of, you know, watching from the sides and hoping to, to get whatever information we can about whether they're really, whether there are only gap junctions, there may also be um, chemical synapses that, that connect the cells as well. Um, they have vesicles have been seen, which are sort of a signature of, of, uh, chemical synapses, but not systematically. So we, you know, if they if they are there, they're not they're not everywhere. There's only not a, a big player in the in the connectivity of neurons in the body. All right, I'm going to call that enough and say. Uh, so let me um, just summarize. So what 
we like about Hydra is that it gives us an opportunity to make this complete connection between neural activity, muscle activity, and behavior. Uh, muscles really do seem to do part of the computation. We often leave them out when we think about neural networks as, as kind of the embodying computation and that basically neurons drive behavior, but one forgets, right, that muscles are in, in, the, in the way uh, and, and in principle, and you know, can do part of the work of, of generating the behavior that we typically ascribe to the, the neural network. Biomechanics also can do part of the computation, right? That's uh, an idea that many people have been uh, floating for a while. You've probably seen some of these beautiful robots, right, that have sort of bendy legs and you can, you can run them across very complicated environments. And just because they have um, a lot of give and flexibility in their legs that lets them interact very, um, very naturally with, with a complex environment, taking away some of the need from a nervous system to have to do sort of detailed computations. And so I think some of these small systems are really an, um, an opportunity to explore deeply that connection between nervous system, muscles and biomechanics in generating, in generating behavior. Uh, we, you know, we've been looking and starting to look in detail at the circuit properties and maybe um, automatic self-assembly via cell type specific components, you know, maybe gap junctions form a, a kind of backbone of how uh, the network assembles itself. And finally, you know, where, where, where we're heading next is try to understand sort of distributed computation. How does an, a distributed network like this without obvious um, decision-making nodes, right? How does it decide how to bend and move? When you watch Hydra, it seems to have somewhat purposeful behavior. You know, where is the kind of brain that, that governs that behavior? All right, I will stop there and take questions. So let me just first check the, um, the chat. Uh, Right. So uh, I, if, if people want to it'd be more fun, if you actually ask your questions um, by voice, but I'm willing to kind of trawl through the, the questions here as well, but I'd be very happy for you to unmute and just ask them live if you'd like to. I think Vijay has his hand up. I think it's, it's a bit complicated to unmute. So I don't, I haven't quite figured mm. out because they don't have the agency to unmute themselves, oh, Okay, but right. I don't quite know how to, yeah, no, but I'll, okay, I'll let definitely. you Yeah. So, yeah. so let's just, let's just go through yeah. the chat. Um, does both muscle sets contracting instead of just one hold an advantage? Well, so yeah, I think my, my feeling about that, you know, is it, does it, you know, why would it make sense for both muscle cells to contract at the same time? So A, maybe they need to, right, to, to get rid of the water. It does seem like it could require more energy, but it requires less neural energy, right? So you only need the one event in the nerve net to drive, to, you know, trigger the, both of the muscle layers. And so it's a simpler problem computationally, if you offload the need to first contract and then elongate, you know, you might need to have two separate sets of neural events that somehow then have to communicate with one another, rather than just the one neural event that drives the two things in, in sequence via the, the muscle dynamics. So that, that's one possible way, you know, if, if computation is expensive for right, to, to figure out how to do it. Um, in, in, you know, so if the nerve nets would need to be much more sophisticated and potentially communicate with one another, maybe that's a much larger cost than just the energy of the, of the muscle events themselves. Uh, why do we observe a wiggly behavior of the wave from doing the contraction phrase, right? Good. That's because um, <clears throat> when it contracts, you know, because of the, the viscoelastic dynamics, it's always trying to kind of uncontract. And so what, what seems to be the case is that um, the sequence of events, the firing events in the nerve net seem to be necessary to kind of bring the animal all the way down, right, into contraction and hold it there for a while. And you can see that the, the, the neural firing is kind of you know, working to counteract the tendency of the body to, to, you know, to elongate out again, just, just by viscoelastic dynamics. So that's one advantage of building the bio, biomechanical model is we can almost, 
we could almost um, predict you know, what that sequence of, of firing events would have to be in order to hold the body into in that contracted state for a certain amount of time. Uh, was pressure a variable of the model? It wasn't uh, a part of the model that I wrote down, but it's definitely a big part of the of the biomechanical model, which I didn't um, give you the equations because there are many, many, you know, it's thousands of, of equations and that's all done by, by Comsol and Comsol takes care of us, uh, for us, how um, the pressure of that, you know, when the muscles contract, they, they generate pressure on this interior fluid. That pressure then gets distributed as a, as a force, right, to, to the, entire, um, uh, the entire shell. And so, you know, which is what the, the idea of the hydrostatic skeleton is. And so it's great that, that, you know, we don't have to figure, you know, we don't have to write those equations down, that there's already software that can kind of take care of all of that for us. Um, is there local computation along the neurides of the nerve death? That's a really interesting question. I don't know. And so we're still at a pretty primitive stage, I would say, of understanding um, the nerve net. You know, we've been able to extract these large scale events, but not look in much more detail, partly because of the difficulties of tracking for long periods of time. I think we're, we're getting to the stage where we could see more um, detail. The neurites there are some movies where one can, can actually see the signals propagating along them, but at the moment we don't quite have the resolution. If we want to you know, look at the whole body and you know, follow its behavior at the same time, we don't quite have the, the fine scale resolution to see all the, all the neuro, neurites as well. And so it would be cool to see, but it might involve a, a different kind of measurement. So one example of a, another um, prep, you know, um, that, that uses Hydra at the moment uh, is from the lab of Jacob Robinson at Rice. And so what Jacob is doing is using microfluidic chambers to, to kind of hold the animal still. And so you can kind of suck them into a, into a small space and hold them still and then do the imaging um, in, a, in a way that's easier, right? Because they're, they're, they're kind of held, held more stationary. And also, uh, because you're holding them still and they're in a microfluidic chamber, you can do now very fine scale sensory manipulations. And so Jacob's lab, you know, nothing I mentioned so far deals with sensory um, signals. And, you know, that's, that's a limitation, I'd say, of, the, of the, uh, the work that we've been doing. We assume that, you know, internal um, Mechano sensation is key, but we haven't seen neurons that we would say are mechanical, you know, mechanically that are firing in a way that that carries that signal. And so hopefully with a lot more data, you know, we'll be able to, to pass out some of those of those details. But I think um, also Jacob's experiments where he's applying very well controlled mechanical signals to Hydra and looking at the at the neural responses are really going to to um, elucidate that problem. Vijay has his hand up. I don't know if you have a question. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 fascinating talk, uh, Adrian. I had a couple of uh, comments on the question. So, I mean, you used a discrete model for the biomechanics, put in springs and dashboards and things like that. There are many active matter models which have been developed for like coarse grained partial differential equation descriptions, which have been very useful. Um, the other comment was the shapes that you showed for the hydra really reminded me a lot of plant tropism that you could right. see. Right, yeah. So that there's a lot of biomechanical models where you have differential growths, which can actually give you contraction. Right. Or, so I so am really it. interested by that connection too. I, you know, there, I also, you know, there's just a lot of really beautiful work that's being done in that, in that space. And uh, you know, I, I don't know if you know Alain Gorielli, he wrote the, exactly. the book. I don't know. So I visited him in Oxford a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, Surely I could be doing better, right? Than this. So, I, I, you know, I, I, part of part of what what you're saying is that this, you know, this console simulation is a pretty brute force approach, yeah. and there may be more elegant mathematical uh, approaches that that we could take. And that's, you know, I bought the book. <laughs> I'm definitely very interested in <laughs> in um, following that up. I, I, you know, I completely agree, and I'm also very interested to see if there's. If there's somewhat more analytical work that we could do that would yeah, yeah. Um, simplify the problem and give us kind of a, a lower dimensional representation that might be um, a little more, you know, straightforward to 
to work with. Yeah. So thank you. Thank you very much for that suggestion. I, I can I like tell you a couple of things. We've been doing some stuff on, on, along those lines. We, oh, we, fabulous. We, yeah. Oh, yeah. I would love to get any references that you have. I'm just at the beginning of a learning process on this. So yeah, any anything you have. I, I, have, a, I have a question though. So, so mm -hmm. what you showed was the behavior in, in the sort of matured phase of the Hydra. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look at the regeneration phase as well, there's fantastic uh, morphogenesis mm -hmm. that happens in the way the Hydra right. actually organizes its head and mouth and uh, mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the various limbs. Um, I mean, there, there is a lot of uh, sort of known facts about how, for instance, the orientation patterns of actin and the muscle fibers really are correlated with uh, the shapes. I wonder if you looked at the neuronal activity at that stage. I don't even know if there are neuronal. So I haven't, but, um, but Rafa, um, Rafa's lab published a paper, um, I think even just this year, uh, Jonathan Lovas is the, is the first author. And so all of the, the movies I showed from Rafa's lab are all part of Jonathan's thesis work. And so what Jonathan focused on, he was very interested in doing kind of graph theoretic um, mm -hmm. characterization. So, you know, he, he looks at graph theoretic properties of the, of the co-firing uh, neural groups over time. So, you know, my, I'm, I'm a little more um, mechanistic, I guess, in the way, the way I think about things. So we have that data as well. And someone from my lab is starting to look at, um, you know, where you start to see um, say waves and things like this. And so we, you know, given that we're, we're also able to estimate movement. So at some point the neurons are just firing, they're not connected to muscle. Mm -hmm. At some point they do become connected to muscle, right? And so yeah. they, they presumably there's a moment at which the neurons start to talk to the muscle, but, but those blobs, as you saw, right, they start to move. And so we can because it's, it's an easier problem to track this little blob than there is that it is to follow the whole animal, we can get a pretty good estimate of the movement of the blob and do really detailed cross-correlation between firing patterns of single neurons or of groups of neurons with movement. And so we can start to see, right, the wiring up of the functional circuitry of Hydra. So I have a rotation student working on that. He's awesome. So I'm hoping he'll stay in my lab and uh, we'll, we'll continue with that problem. Great. So I think we're just about on out of time, but I was wondering if we could kind of reach back to make a connection with your first talk, which was, you know, laid out the, the whole coding problem. So right. I'm wondering, do you have a sense of the dimensionality of these movements? For example, if you take all of these things and try to do your manifolds and dimensional reduction, what do, what do, yeah. you, what do you see? Right. Yeah, I haven't done that yet, but that is, you know, it's definitely what I've written in every grant that I've written about hydras that we're going to do that. What I want uh, in order to do that properly, you remember the green, um, you know, grid that we drew on Hydra. What would be perfect, right, is to have long sequences of that grid pattern that would be kind of the high dimensional representation of movement. And then to run that, you know, the most straightforward thing would be to run that through a variational autoencoder to see what is the low dimensional space of all the possible movements or all of the movements that are carried out by Hydra. I think it's probably pretty low dimensional. That's my guess. And, you know, I think that's um, uh, validated in some sense by the low dimensionality, as far as we can tell, of the neural activity too, right? Contraction burst is one huge, you know, unitary event. There's very little, um, you know, these slow waves are, are local and are very kind of simple. So they're, you know, I, I imagine that the body is kind of tiled with the ability to do these kind of slow contractions that, you know, they're only very subtly connected with, with, with movement. So, yeah, I, I, what, um, I like to think about, about the two time scales, right, of, of muscle control is that that kind of pauses out some of the dimensionality of the problem that you have this sort of one global, you know, full body action. And then the strings that you can pull on these slower, smaller events that, that sort of sort out, right? The, the, the more detailed yet slower um, modes, right? Act activity modes and action modes of, of the system. Yeah, so definitely would love to have a, a that analysis done. <laughs> I'm hoping within a year we'll we'll get to it. Okay, so Vijay, I don't know how um, what the hard stop constraints are, so I'll let you take over. Thank thank you again, Adrian, for the last two days. That was actually brilliant. Oh, thank you. That was thank so you, fantastic. Adrian. Fantastic. Thanks for all the great questions.
Uh, I guess that concludes the sessions for the day, unless there are comments, questions by anybody. So let's thank both. Slack, like Slack is a friend, right? Since Adrian is okay with that. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we should thank both Adrian and Suhita for wonderful yeah. talks over the past two days. Great. Well, thank you. Good luck so with the rest you. of the course. Enjoy yourself. I, I have some conversations going on offline with some of the, the students. So happy to continue those in, in Slack for anyone that wants to discuss more. Yeah, that'll be great if you could do that. Thank All you. Right. Thank you. Right. See you so guys. We'll see you here and come back tomorrow, same time.